This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 4. Coming up on Space Time. The first clue to solve the mystery of dark matter. Osiris Rex enters orbit around the asteroid Bennu. And the mystery deepens as to what's powering the corona seen around monster black holes. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. There's evidence that star formation can heat up and move dark matter around. The findings reported in the Journal of the Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society provides the first real observational evidence of an effect known as dark matter heating and may provide new clues as to what dark matter really is. Dark matter is a mysterious invisible substance which makes up about 80% of all the matter in the universe. It often comes as a shock to people when they realise that everything we see in the universe, from people and houses, cars, dogs and cats, through to planets, stars and galaxies, combined make up only about 20% of the total mass of the universe. The rest, 80%, is dark matter. The problem is, scientists have no idea what dark matter is composed of. They know it's real because they can see its gravitational interaction with normal matter, but that's it. For years, researchers have been trying to study the effects of dark matter at the centres of nearby dwarf galaxies. Dwarf galaxies are small, faint galaxies that are typically found orbiting larger galaxies like our own Milky Way. And the thing is, dwarf galaxies appear to have proportionally more dark matter than larger galaxies like the Milky Way. They could hold clues that may help science better understand the nature of dark matter. And the key to studying dark matter may lie in how stars are formed in these little galaxies. When stars form, strong winds can push gas and dust away from the heart of the galaxy. As a result, the galaxy's centre has less mass, and that may affect how much gravity is felt by the remaining dark matter. With less gravitational attraction, the dark matter gains energy and migrates away from the centre, an effect called dark matter heating. To get a handle on the issue, astrophysicists measured the amount of dark matter at the centres of 16 dwarf galaxies with very different star formation histories. They found that galaxies that stopped forming stars long ago had higher dark matter densities at their centres than those still forming stars today. And this supports the theory that older galaxies had less dark matter heating. The study's lead author, Professor Justin Reed from Surrey University, says a truly remarkable relationship was discovered between the amount of dark energy at the centres of these tiny dwarfs and the amount of star formation they've experienced over their lives. It seems the dark matter at the centres of the star-forming dwarf galaxies appears to have been heated up and pushed out. The findings help provide new constraints on dark matter models. It means dark matter must be able to form dwarf galaxies that exhibit a range of central densities. And those densities must relate to the amount of star formation taking place. The findings could represent a smoking gun, taking scientists a step closer to understanding what dark matter is. The authors now plan on expanding their research by measuring the central dark matter density in a larger sample of dwarfs, pushing to even fainter galaxies, and testing a wider range of dark matter models. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has achieved orbit insertion around the near-Earth asteroid Bennu. The 492-metre-wide space rock has one of the highest known chances of hitting the Earth, with a 1 in 2700 chance of impacting the Earth sometime between 2175 and 2199. If it were to hit the Earth, the resulting impact would be the equivalent of 1200 megatons of TNT. 10-1955 10-1955 Bennu is what's known as a carbonaceous Apollo group asteroid. That means it's a near or near-Earth object with an orbit that intersects with and crosses Earth's orbit around the Sun. Bennu is what astronomers call a B-type carbonaceous asteroid. They're generally similar to regular C-type carbon asteroids, but with surface spectra suggesting anhydrous silicates, hydrated clay minerals, organic polymers, magnetite and sulfides. 
launched back on September the 8th, 2016, from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida aboard an Atlas V rocket, the 2,110kg Osiris Rex spacecraft arrived at Bennu in October 2018. The spacecraft spending three years orbiting the asteroid and mapping its surface and geology, studying its evolution, composition, chemistry and mineralogy. The orbital insertion manoeuvre, carried out some 110 million kilometres from Earth, set a new space exploration record for the smallest object ever to be orbited by a spacecraft. Inching around the asteroid at a snail's pace, OSIRIS-REx's first orbit marks a huge leap for humankind. Never before has a spacecraft circled so close to such a small celestial object, one with barely enough gravity to keep a vehicle in stable orbit. It's almost lost in the news of New Horizons encounter was the arrival of the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft at asteroid Bennu. It's been a 2 billion kilometre two-year journey to catch up with this asteroid. They've been approaching it for the last few months, getting closer. But on New Year's Day, actually entered orbit in an incredible, very tiny orbit, quite close to the surface. And actually orbiting at a speed of just six centimetres per second. So it's probably the, the tiniest and slowest orbiting object and certainly the smallest object that's ever been orbited around. That's Glenn Nagel from NASA's Deep Space Communications Complex near Canberra. OSIRIS-REx is circling Bennu at just 1.75 kilometres from the asteroid centre. That's closer than any other spacecraft has ever orbited a celestial body. The previous closest orbit for a planetary body was set back in May 2016, when the European Space Agency's Rosetta spacecraft orbited about 7 kilometres from the centre of the comet 67P sheremov gerasimenko The 1.75 kilometre distance is considered comfortable enough to keep OSIRIS-REx locked to Bennu, which has a gravitational force just 5 millionth that of Earth. The spacecraft will remain in orbit around Bennu through to mid-February, circling the body at allegedly 62 hours per orbit. OSIRIS-REx principal investigator Dante Loretta from the University of Arizona in Tucson says the probe's eight-second burn of its thrusters, which placed it into orbit, meant the navigation campaign was now coming to an end, and the scientific mapping and sample site selection phase of the mission is now beginning. Now that the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft is closer to Bennu, physical details about the asteroid will leap into sharper focus, and the spacecraft's tour of this rubble pile of primordial debris will become increasingly detailed. OSIRIS-REx Flight Dynamic Systems Manager Mike Maru from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, says the orbital design is highly dependent on Bennu's physical properties, such as the asteroid's mass and gravity field, which simply won't known before the spacecraft's arrival. Up until now, scientists have had to account for a wide variety of possible scenarios in their computer simulations just to make sure they could safely navigate the spacecraft so close to Bennu. As the team learn more about the asteroid, they're able to incorporate more information to hone in on the final orbital design. Having completed a preliminary survey of Bennu with flybys of the South Pole on December the 16th, the spacecraft moved to a safe holding pattern 50 kilometres from the asteroid, giving the navigation team a chance to regroup and prepare for orbit insertion. Next, Lockheed Martin engineers who built the spacecraft programmed it to begin moving back to a position about 15 kilometres over Bennu's North Pole. That positioned the probe for three burns of its thrusters over the course of 10 days designed to place the spacecraft into orbit. Even though OSIRIS-REx is now in the most stable orbit possible, Bennu's gravitational pull is so tenuous that keeping the spacecraft safe will require close monitoring and regular adjustments. You see, the gravity of Bennu is so small, forces like solar radiation and even thermal pressure from Bennu's surface become much more relevant. They can push the spacecraft around in orbit much more than if it were orbiting, say, the Earth or Mars, where gravity is by far the dominant force. So the OSIRIS-REx navigation team will use trim manoeuvres to slightly thrust the spacecraft in one direction or another to correct its orbit to counter these small forces. Meanwhile, mission managers have developed three-dimensional models of Bennu's surface based on a preliminary global imaging and mapping survey of the asteroid's terrain. This means that instead of celestial navigation, they'll now be able to rely on landmarks identified on Bennu's surface to track OSIRIS-REx and ultimately guide the spacecraft to a sample collection site clear of boulders and large rocks. Another crucial objective involves getting a better handle on Bennu's mass and gravity, features that will influence the planning of the rest of the mission, most notably the touchdown on the surface for sample collection in 2020. In the case of Bennu, scientists can only measure these features by getting OSIRIS-REx to fly very close to the surface to see how its trajectory bends from Bennu's gravitational pull. 
In late February, the spacecraft will perform a series of close flybys of Bernoulli for several months. These are designed to collect high-resolution images of every square centimetre of the asteroid in order to help select a sampling site. Then, by the middle of 2020, the spacecraft will briefly touch down on the asteroid surface to retrieve its first samples. OSIRIS-REx is slated to leave Bernoulli's orbit in March 2021, with a sample return capsule being jettisoned for a parachute landing in Utah in September 2023. We'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The study has found that the magnetic fields around supermassive black holes at the centres of galaxies aren't strong enough to power the coronal clouds of superheated plasma seen around them. The surprising findings reported in the Astrophysical Journal mean science's understanding of the physics of black holes still has an awful long way to go. The study marked the first time that researchers were able to measure the strength of these magnetic fields found around monster black holes. Astronomers have often seen bright coronae of superheated plasma, similar to the corona around the sun, but shining brilliantly around supermassive black holes. These supermassive black hole corona can be heated to phenomenal temperatures well over a billion degrees Celsius. It was long assumed that, like that of the sun, these black hole coronae were being heated by magnetic field energies. The problem is, magnetic fields had never been measured around black holes, leaving a fair degree of uncertainty regarding the exact mechanism. Back in 2014, researchers had predicted that electrons in the plasma surrounding black holes would emit a special kind of light known as synchrotron radiation as they exist together with the magnetic field forces in the corona. Specifically, this radiation would be in the radio band, meaning electromagnetic waves with very long wavelengths and low frequencies. And so the authors of our study set out to measure these fields. The team used observations from the European Southern Observatory's Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array Telescope, ALMA, in Chile. They studied the supermassive black holes at the centres of two relatively nearby active galaxies, IC 4329A, which is about 200 million light-years away, and NGC 985, which is about 580 million light-years distant. They then compared these measurements with observations from two other radio telescopes, the Very Large Array in New Mexico and the Australia Telescope Compact Array near Narrabri in New South Wales. Both these observatories measure slightly different frequency bands. The authors did detect the expected excess in radio emissions originating from the synchrotron radiation, as well as emissions from jets fired by the black holes as they fed on infalling matter. They were able to determine that the corona had a size of around 40 Schwarzschild radii, that is the radius of a black hole from which not even light can escape. They were also able to determine that the magnetic field had a strength of 10 Gauss. That's a figure a bit stronger than the magnetic field at the surface of the Earth, but quite a bit less than that given out by even a typical refrigerator magnet. Very puzzling indeed. The findings mean the magnetic field is far too weak to be able to drive the intense heating of the corona around these black holes. So it's a case of back to the drawing boards, as the team now look for alternative methods to try and explain coronal heating. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. During 2018, the Moon moved a further 3.8 centimetres away from the Earth. The Sun lost over 174 trillion tonnes of its mass, resulting in the Earth's orbit around the Sun increasing in diameter by 1.5 centimetres. Over 150 billion new stars were formed in the visible universe, and the universe expanded by over 60 trillion kilometres due mostly to dark energy. Meanwhile, a new issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine has hit the newsstands, previewing some of the astronomical highlights for this year. Joining us now with the details is the magazine's editor, Jonathan Nally. So in the January issue of Australian Sky and Telescope, we cover uh, a new mission, it's actually a double mission that's been sent off to the innermost planet of the solar system, Mercury, which is actually the hardest planet to get to. It's easier to get to Pluto in most ways than it is to get to Mercury. Uh, Why is that? 
That's because as you, as you get closer to the sun, the sun tries to pull you in faster and faster. It's like going downhill, basically. You're going downhill gravitationally. So as, as you get closer to the sun, you're going to pick up speed, and you're going to pick up more and more and more speed. And the problem then becomes if you're aiming to go to Mercury, which is um, you know, two-thirds of the way closer to the sun than we are, then how do you stop yourself um, when you get there? You know, you, you're going to go sailing straight past unless you've got an almighty big rocket to slow yourself down. But the problem is, um, by carrying an almighty big rocket to slow yourself down, you won't have any room or, or mass availability to have anything useful like cameras and that sort of thing. So when they send spacecraft off to the inner planets, Venus and Mercury, they, they, they do what they call these planetary flybys. And they're going to do multiple flybys of uh, Mercury and I think Venus and Earth. For this These year. are another type of gravity assist, aren't they? <clears throat> They're gravity assist, yeah. And um, the idea in this case will be to slow yourself down uh, as you're going into the inner part of the solar system and do some big looping orbits around the sun, going around a couple of these planets a few times to sort of bring yourself into a uh, slow yourself down and bring yourself into a nice orbit finally to reach your target, which in this case would be Mercury. When you, when you do a gravitational assist going the other way in the, in the outer part of the solar system, you want to pick up speed as you do these gravitational slingshots past, say, uh, Jupiter or Saturn. So, yeah, it is actually tricky getting to um, the innermost planet. And that's why, in fact, it's only ever been visited by two missions, one in the 1970s and one uh, just in the 2000s. Um, uh, about seven or eight years ago. That's Messenger. Yeah, exactly. So um, some basic facts about Mercury. It's covered in craters, and it looks a lot like the moon. Uh, it orbits the sun, as I said, about two-thirds closer in than, than we are. Its mass is only about 6% of that of the Earth. And being so close to the sun, of course, you'd imagine it's hot. Well, it certainly is. Uh, in the areas that are in direct sunlight, it's about 427 degrees Celsius, which is pretty warm. But there are shadowed areas in craters that can get down to minus 223 degrees. Imagine that. So you're so close to the sun, but you can be more than 200 degrees below zero Celsius. Is it tidally locked? Um, it's sort of, yeah. It's got a complex um, uh, resonance, they call it, between uh, its, its rotation period and, and its period around the sun. It's not a one-to-one -one tidally locked thing like the moon is. The moon, as it goes around the Earth, only shows the one face towards the Earth because its rotation period is the same as uh, its, its orbital, orbital period. period around the Earth. Yeah, uh, Mercury is not like that. It, it, they thought it a long time ago that it used to be, but it isn't. No, but there is a resonance between uh, its rotation period and its orbital period around the sun. And that sort of confused uh, a lot of astronomers in, in years gone by. In fact, it took Eddington and Einstein to work that out, didn't it? Yeah, and in fact, um, this particular mission that's the, that they've sent off now, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a two spacecraft mission. Um, it's a joint thing between Europe and Japan. Europe are contributing a thing called the Mercury Planet Orbiter, or Mercury Planetary Orbiter, and Japan is contributing the Mercury Magnetospheric Orbiter. And the overall mission is called Beti Colombo. Beti Colombo, it's a strange sounding name, you might think. It's, it's named after Giuseppe Beppi Colombo, who is an Italian scientist who worked out this thing about Mercury's orbit and its rotation period. So they've named it after him. He's also the dude who first implemented interplanetary gravity assist, a manoeuvre he used in 1974 with the Mariner 10 mission. Now a technique, of course, used commonly by pretty well all interplanetary probes. And in that case, I think he's probably the first interplanetary flyby uh, scientist to be called a dude. I'm sure he'd very much appreciate being known as a dude. <laughs> I think that's the only time I've ever used that word in my whole life. <laughs> it's not one well, we come from different worlds. <laughs> we come from different worlds. Never mind. All right, so what are we going on with here? Yeah, so, right. so Mercury is an interesting place for all sorts of reasons. There's this orbital resonance we spoke about, about the, um, you know, the rotation period and the orbital period, and the fact that it's so close to the sun, and yet there are, there are thought to be actual deposits of ice at the bottom of deep craters that never see sunlight, these, these places where I said the temperature is really, really low. So the Bepi Colombo mission is going to tell us more about the planet's history and its geology and where that ice might have come from. Highlights of 2019. In the January issue, we give you a full rundown of what to see in the night sky for the coming year. So there'll be lots of things to look forward to, actually, in 2019. Um, major stargazing events. There's going to be a partial eclipse of the moon for a start in July, visible across Australia. It's in the morning of July the 17th. Although it won't be the best eclipse ever seen, but it's the only one we're going to get this year. That'll be followed in December by a partial solar eclipse, 
but that'll only be visible from across the northern part of Australia. So really, we're just talking about Darwin there. Um, that's going to be in December. Our cousins in New Zealand are going to be treated to a, a fairly rare event later in the year, though, of course, and that's called a, a transit of Mercury. Um, this is where the innermost planet, Mercury, uh, gets between us and the sun. And from our point of view, it looks like a little black dot sort of creeping across the face of the sun. Uh, transits of Mercury are far more common than the transits of Venus, the last one of which was a few years ago, and we won't see another one in our lifetime now because it's going to be more than 100 years. Uh, Speak for but, yourself. <laughs> you're, going to, you're going to cry, Jennifer, you freeze yourself and come back, <laughs> are you? <laughs> Probably just the head. <laughs> just the head bit, yeah. yeah. Forget the rest of it, just the head. Um, yeah, so um, if, you, if you're in New Zealand later in the year, you'll be able to see this transit of Mercury. There are going to be several lunar occultations of Saturn during the year visible from Australia. A lunar occultation is where the moon, as it's trundling along in its orbit around the Earth, temporarily blocks from view anything that's in the background. It's sort of like an eclipse, I suppose you'd call it. Um, and in this case, it's going to be Saturn several times. Um, the, the moon's going to be going along, and you'll see it come up to Saturn, Saturn being in the background, and all of a sudden Saturn will wink out as the moon goes in front, and then a little while later Saturn will pop out into view again on the other side of the moon. So it'll be really interesting to see, and, and a good demonstration that the moon is actually moving in its orbit around the Earth, because as it, as it covers up Saturn, and then later on as it uncovers Saturn, that means that the moon has moved that far through space and Saturn pops back into view again. And of course, there'll be the usual meteor showers, almost one of them per month, and plenty of good views of the planets and groupings of planets, Stuart. And the 100th anniversary of the International Astronomical Union. Yeah, yeah, so the, the 100th anniversary of the International Astronomical Union is going to be uh, pretty good. They're organising or, or coordinating lots of activities all around the world, including here in Australia. Not many people in public land know about the IAU, as it's called. Unless they're fans of Pluto, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, of course, because the, the decision was made at the IAU to demote Pluto, but it's the worldwide body of um, astronomers. Uh, each each science has its own national bodies, and then there are international bodies. So for astronomy, the IAU is it. And uh, yeah, so there should be lots and lots of things happening around the countryside. Stay tuned. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Beijing has carried out two more rocket launches to round out 2018 with no less than 39 missions, more than any other nation on Earth. China's final launches of the year included a Long March 3C rocket, which blasted off from the Zhaichang Satellite Launch Center in southwestern China, Sichuan Province. It was carrying what was described by Beijing as the number three telecommunications technology test satellite. In reality, the spacecraft was the third in a new constellation of TJS early warning Chinese military satellites for the People's Liberation Army. They're designed to detect and track ballistic missile launches by their infrared signatures. The flight was followed a few days later by the launch of a Long March 2D rocket from the Zhuan Satellite Launch Center in the remote Gobi Desert region of northwestern China's Inner Mongolia. The mission was carrying the Hongyang-1 experimental telecommunications satellite and six Yonghai-2 satellites. The two-stage Long March 2D was equipped with a new liquid-fueled third stage designed to provide multiple firings needed to place the seven satellites into their specific orbits. Three of the six Yonghai-2 satellites were released into a 520km high orbit with the three remaining Yonghai-2 series spacecraft boosted into a 1095km high orbit. The Yonghai-2 satellites use Global Navigation Satellite System radio occultation to collect atmospheric data for weather predictions and for ionospheric climate and gravity research. The seventh spacecraft in the payload was the Hongyang-1 experimental satellite. This one is an experimental telecommunication spacecraft, testing LNKA band radio technologies in orbit as part of what will be a planned new cell phone telecommunications constellation of more than 320 spacecraft in low Earth orbit. This flight marked the 39th orbit launch by China in 2018 and the 297th launch of a Long March series rocket. Those 39 launches for 2018 compares to just 31 orbital launches for the United States, 20 for Russia, 8 for the European Space Agency, 7 for India, 6 for Japan and 3 orbital launches for New Zealand.
And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study shows the rate of men dying from malignant melanoma has risen around the world, while in some countries the rates are steadily falling for women. The findings, reported at the 2018 NCRI Cancer Conference, looked at data from 33 countries, including Australia. Overall, the highest three-year average death rates for 2013 to 2015 were found in Australia, with 5.72 male fatalities for every 100,000 men and 2.53 for every 100,000 women. A new report warns that half of all Australian adults are now consuming more sugar than the World Health Organization's recommendations to keep sugar to less than 10% of total calorie intake. Researchers found 47% of Australians surveyed were high free sugar consumers. Free sugars include added sugars and sugars naturally present in honey, syrups and fruit juices. Beverages contributed the most free sugar in diets, especially for young adults, where they made up almost half of the total free sugar energy intake. Paleontologists say a newly discovered species of the famous first bird, that is Archaeopteryx, supports its status as the transitional fossil between dinosaurs and birds. A report in the journal Historical Biology claims that, contrary to some previous studies, Archaeopteryx can now be conclusively shown to be a primitive bird antecedent and an evolutionary intermediate between dinosaurs and birds, which possessed both teeth and clawed fingers. The new study also used state-of-the-art three-dimensional synchrotron microtomography to help virtually dissect the fossil and identify skeletal adaptions that would have helped this particular species, known as Archaeopteryx albus duerfri, to fly. The fossil, discovered in a quarry in southern Germany in 1990, is around 400,000 years younger than any other Archaeopteryx found so far. The analysis shows that it had more features in common with modern birds than with their dinosaurian ancestors, including thin air-filled bones, increased area for the attachment of flight muscles on the wishbone, and a reinforced configuration of bones in the wrist and hand. The 150 million year old fossils of Archaeopteryx have been known since 1861, with some 12 specimens having been recovered so far. It's been confirmed that migrating Neolithic farmers from the Near East brought their dogs with them as they spread into Eurasia around 9,000 years ago. It already been known that these people brought sheep, cows, wheat and barley, among other domesticated species. But a new report in the journal Biology Letters found their dogs also came along for the ride, and then intermingled with native European dogs upon arrival. You're listening to Space Time, I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.